Why is God faithful to us? It is not because of our strength. It's not because of our wisdom. It's not because of our worthiness. It is because of his graciousness. Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. Tonight, what I'm going to speak with you about is where faithlessness leads you. Where faithlessness leads you. The way that the book of Genesis is constructed, especially right here at the median point in, in the entire book, is, is a bit different for us to see because right after Abraham dies, you see that, that Isaac and Rebekah have two sons, Jacob and Esau. And, and you see the expulsion of all of Abraham's other sons, they're, they're given gifts, but they're not given the blessing. They're not given the covenant blessing. That, that's given only to Isaac. Isaac is the one who receives the blessing of God's covenant promises because he was the son of promise, not Ishmael and not any of the other sons born to Abraham. But then the, the narrative, the record in chapter 25, moves on very quickly. It moves on very quickly, almost as though Isaac doesn't have much of an adulthood. And it moves on very quickly to his two sons, Jacob and Esau. And you see that Esau, being the eldest, who we would assume is going to receive the blessing, he's not the one who receives the blessing. It's, in fact, Jacob, the younger, the supplanter, the, the trickster. And you see just in chapter 25, you see a number of decades advance. A number of decades of years advance just in that one chapter. The boys go from, from their grandfather dying to being born to then being old enough to trick one another and to try to receive a blessing from their father. You, you see multiple decades be crossed there in chapter 25. And you, you begin to ask the question, well, what happened to Isaac? Well, what happened to Isaac's life? Because seemingly it's just moved on past him very quickly. But in Genesis chapter 26, you get a little more of a bird's eye view of Isaac's life. So chapter 25 advances the narrative quite a bit. It tells you which child is going to be blessed, and then you're going to see that narrative play out. So then in 26, it kind of zooms in on Isaac's life because Isaac is the one who receives the blessing. He receives the covenant promise from Abraham. So you see how that covenant promise is brought about. How, how God is faithful to his promise, even to Isaac. And when you read these first 11 verses in chapter 26, you start to ask yourself, have I read this before? It seems like I've already read this in the book of Genesis. And in fact, you have already read an account just like this twice. You, you have read about Abraham handing his wife over to Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 12. And then you read about Abraham handing his wife over to Abimelech in Gerar in Genesis chapter 20. And now in Genesis chapter 26, you're reading another account. It's not a repeat. It's just another account. And now it's not the, the father. Now it's the son. And son is handing over his wife to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. But the first thing that you see is in verses 1 through 5. You, you see the basis, the basis, the foundation for why Isaac should have trusted the Lord. Isaac should have trusted the Lord because the Lord is always faithful to his word. It's, it's, a, it's a truth as profound yet as simple as that. Isaac should have trusted the Lord because the Lord always makes good on his promises. And the Lord reaffirms the promises made to Abraham that they are being received and will be reaffirmed to him, to Isaac. When you get down in verse 6 through 11, that, that's where things start getting a little bit crazy. That's where Isaac seemingly ignores the first five verses of the chapter. He seemingly forgets that God Almighty is the one who's promised to bless him and to care for him and to protect him. He seemingly forgot it just a few verses after. And lest we condemn, lest we condemn Isaac too quickly, let's just ask ourselves, how often do we read God's Word 
And then seemingly just a few verses later in our life, we, we start to question what we read. And, and we, we seemingly forget. Brother Eric and I were, were talking about some of these very simple commands in the New Testament. Don't be bitter against one another. Don't grumble. Don't murmur. And we read those and we affirm those. And then we find ourselves doing those things as though we, we just never read it in the first place. So lest we condemn Isaac too quickly, let's, let's remember that faithlessness is a path that all of us not only can walk down, faithlessness is a path that all of us walk down. All of us walk down that path from time to time. So I'll show you two paths that faithlessness will lead you down. Once we get to verses 6 and 7, and they'll go there very quickly. If you want to summarize the entirety of this passage, you can write this sentence down with me. When you act faithlessly, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Don't miss that. That's the point of this passage. When you, and I'm I'm going to carefully qualify what I mean by that, when you act faithlessly. There are people that act faithlessly toward God all the time. They're not believers in God. That does not mean that God is going to act faithfully toward them. That doesn't mean that God is going to be gracious towards them. Note this about Isaac. Isaac was the man of God's choosing. Isaac was one of God's chosen ones. Isaac was in covenant relationship with God by faith. But he stumbled into faithlessness. And when God's children who are in covenant relationship with him, when they are in covenant relationship with him, when they stumble in faithlessness, fear not, God remains faithful. Why? Because God has made a covenant with you. As Christians, God has made a covenant with you through Jesus, and he's not going to abandon that covenant. He's not going to abandon his faithfulness when we are full of faithlessness. So when you act faithlessly, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Look at verse 1 through 5, and you're going to see the foundation for trusting God. The foundation for trusting God, and it's simply this, God is faithful to his word. Look at verse 1. It says, Now there was a famine in the land. When you read chapter 26 in Genesis, if, you're, if you remember back in chapter 12, it is almost a parallel account. It is almost an exact parallel account. In Genesis chapter 12, starting there in verse 10, there's a famine in the land. And, and that famine in the land, in the land of Canaan, prompts Abraham to do what? It prompts him to leave the Negev, to leave the southern part of Canaan, and it prompts him to go down into Egypt. He goes down into Egypt, and then he tells Sarai, his wife, if anybody asks, you just tell them that you're my sister because I don't trust these people. They're going to kill me because you're beautiful. He thinks highly of the way his wife looks, but he thinks lowly of the way that God protects. So it says, now there was a famine in the land. Besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham, far more than 60 years since that time, far more. And it says, and Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. So he goes to Gerar. Gerar is the southernmost border there in Canaan. It's the land of the Philistines at this time. Now you read this and you think that, okay, so Isaac goes to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. So he's running into the same guy that Abraham ran into in Genesis chapter 20. It would seem, though, that that, that would be a wrong assumption, What's more likely is that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, is not a name, it's actually a title. Because in Genesis chapter 20, that precedes this passage by at least 60 years. So the Abimelech that Abraham ran into, if it's the same guy, would have had to have been very young at that point in order for for Isaac to run into the same guy. And it seems like Abimelech doesn't know Isaac very well, and he may not even remember what happened the first time when his daddy came into Philistia, into Gerar. So it says that he went to Gerar, to Abimelech, 
King is my father is what Abimelech means. Went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Verse 2, and the Lord appeared to him. The Lord didn't just appear to Abraham. Now the son has inherited the promises. And so the Lord Almighty appears to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Why would the Lord command Isaac to not go down to Egypt? There could be a multitude of reasons why the Lord would command Isaac not to go down there. But one of the reasons might simply be this. That's what his father had done when there was a famine. His father had gone down to Egypt. And so it would be Isaac's natural inclination to imitate his father. And you'll see that, that Isaac is seemingly Abraham 2.0 anyway. He was going to go down to Egypt unless the Lord commanded him. So he said, do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. That passage right there is strikingly parallel, like I said, to Genesis chapter 12. In fact, 26, 1 through 3 and 12, 1 through 3 are almost identical. In chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, the Lord issues his call on Abraham's life. And he tells him to pack his things up and to leave his father's home in Ur of the Chaldees. And he says, go to a land of which I will show you and I'll bless you and I'll multiply you and I'll make you fruitful and those who bless you I'll bless them those who curse you I'll curse them and I'll give you possession of all of this land to you and your offspring so that you are a blessing to all the peoples of the earth so now the Lord gives a call to Isaac and his call is prohibitive his call says don't go down to Egypt you just sojourn in the land that I will show you I'm not going to tell you exactly where I'm going to take you. I'm just going to promise you that I'll be the one taking you. Let's not miss that. The Lord tells Abraham and the Lord tells Isaac, you go into a land that I will show you. I'm not going to tell you where I'm taking you, but I will tell you that I'm going to be the one taking you. If God acted that way toward Abraham and God acted that way toward Isaac, does that not establish for us a timeless principle about the way God acts towards his children? See, God does not tell us the future, but God tells us that he'll be with us every step of the way. God does not tell us everywhere that he is going to take us. And God does not tell us the timing of everywhere that he is going to take us. But what he has told us is, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So let's not distance ourselves too much from this call that was on Abraham's life or the call that was on Isaac's life. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Isaac, it's time to go. And you're going to follow me where I take you. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but I'll tell you that I'll go with you. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm taking you there not for your harm. I'm taking you there for your good. Isaac seemingly forgets this right there in the very next paragraph. He forgets that God Almighty has just told him, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to care for you. I'm going to do good things for you. He says, sojourn in this land. You know, that word sojourn is interesting. It's a favorite word of Moses here as he records Genesis, chap Genesis the entirety of the book, actually. Sojourning means to travel as a foreigner, to live as a foreigner. So Abraham was a sojourner. Isaac was a sojourner. Jacob was a sojourner. They lived in the land, but they weren't counted as residents. They were counted as aliens. They were told to sojourn, to, to live in the land as though it belonged to them already. But the land did not belong to them already. 
They were commanded to live there trusting God's promise that God would give them a land, that God would give them that possession. And so they were called their entire lives to live by faith, live as though the promises of God are in your hands, trusting that they are secure. You just sojourn in this land. You don't have the title to the land, but you have the promise to the land. It's the same way that we're called to live in this world. We are called to live as sojourners, as resident aliens, knowing that we have the promises of God already, but we have not yet received them in fullness. So he says, sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and your offspring, I will I will, future tense, I will give you all these lands and I will establish, I will confirm, I will carry it out, I will fulfill the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. Now where is it that God swore an oath to Abraham? So God made promises to Abraham, he reiterated that promise. He made promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, in Genesis 13, in Genesis 15, 17, 19, 21. He made promise to Abraham. But in Genesis chapter 22, the Lord swore an oath. You see, the promises of God are binding. When God makes a promise, they are binding. But when God swears an oath, not only are they binding, they are emphatic. They are emphatic. God took a, a special sense in order to, to make the promise and to seal it, to make sure that they knew and they understood that promise. There's one place in Abraham's life, in the Abrahamic narrative, where God swore an oath. Interestingly enough, Isaac was present for it. Isaac heard the oath. Genesis chapter 22, I'm going to read verses 15 through 18. It says, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time. Well, when did he call to Abraham the first time? In Genesis chapter 22, the binding of Isaac, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham the first time when Abraham had the butcher's knife in his hand and he was about to slay his son, his only son, as proof of his faith. And as he's about to slay his son, the angel of the Lord speaks up and says, don't lay a hand on the boy. But then the angel of the Lord speaks again. And it says, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. If Abraham could hear this, who else could hear it? Isaac. Isaac was probably 12 inches away from Abraham. Isaac probably still had the binding on his hands and feet when he heard this oath. And he says, and said, by myself, I have sworn. What does he mean, by myself, I have sworn? That's essentially saying, God saying, on my honor. God can't say, I swear by God. So he has to say, I swear by myself. By myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this. What has he done? He's obeyed the Lord's command. He's kept his statutes. He's kept his laws. Because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply. That's what God's way of saying amen to himself. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. The Lord swore an oath to Abraham. And at this point, Isaac has a front row seat. Isaac hears this same oath. And so now, as Isaac has become a man, Isaac has become a father, Isaac is going to be reaffirmed in this covenant. I swore an oath to Abraham and you're receiving the fruits of that oath. He says, I will establish. 
Back in chapter 26, verse 3, I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will, listen to how this is just a rehearsal of chapter 22, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So he says, by myself I've sworn this. Isaac, you can know that this is going to be true. Isaac, you can bank your life. You can bank your eternity on the promises that are made to you. They were made to Abraham, and God Almighty has sworn an oath. He'll carry this out. That's the foundation for trusting God's promise because God's the one that made it. And God doesn't go back on his word. God remains faithful to his word. Why? Why does God remain faithful to his word? He can't deny himself. He's not going to go back on who he is. The Lord is faithful in everything. So now, look at at chapter 26, verse 6 through 7. Isaac seemingly forgets these first five verses very quickly because he receives this appearance from the Lord as he's in Gerar. And so now he has time to set up his tent, as it were. Verse 6, so Isaac settled in Gerar, two paths, two paths that faithfulness, faithlessness will lead you down. Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. He seemingly, again, like his father, he sure did believe in the beauty of his wife, but he didn't trust in the faithfulness of the Lord. He thought people would move heaven and earth, murder him in order to take his wife, but he didn't think God would move heaven and earth to protect him. So look at these two different paths that faithlessness led Isaac down, understanding that faithlessness will lead us down those same paths. Path number one, faithlessness will lead you to fear man rather than trust God. Faithlessness will lead you to fear man rather than trust God. We don't yet live in a society, in a that has canonized laws that outlaw Christianity. But we live in a culture that has unwritten rules. We live in a culture that that has unwritten laws. Where if you talk about Christian beliefs, if you talk about biblical truths, those are the same things, by the way. You talk about biblical truths in a public sphere, what happens? That kind of person is not celebrated. That kind of person is told that they are intolerant. They're told that they are bigoted. They're told that they're hateful. When you tell people the truth of God's word, faithlessness will say this. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't want people talking badly about me. I don't want people looking poorly at me. I don't want people thinking lesser of me. Because I really care about what people think of me. I I, I really care, and so I'm not going to bring that up. I don't want to make people feel bad. And so we'll fear man rather than trust God. How often do we reason like this? Let's take this a, a, a turn the other way. How often do we think this? We, we are commanded very clearly. It is a command just as much as it is a command to not lie or to not kill. Jesus said, go. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. That includes going across the street to our neighbors. That's not just something that evangelists do. That's not just something that soul winners do or a pastor does. That's something that every Christian is commanded to do. We say, well, if I go across the street and I I talk to my neighbor, I just don't know what they're going to say to me. I don't know that I'm going to be able to answer them. I I just really think that they're going to be hostile to what I have to say. What is that? 
That's, that's not just fear of the interaction. That is fear of man. That is fear of the response that this person may or may not give. And rather than trust God and just obey the great commandment, the great commission to go, we would, we would rather offend God by disobeying him than we would offend an unbelieving person with the truth of the gospel. Have we ever thought of it that way? That we hold off speaking the truth to people who don't believe the truth because we're worried about hurting them or we're worried about offending them. And all the while, it doesn't bother us that we offend God. It doesn't bother us that our disobedience is dishonoring to God. What does it amount to? It amounts to faithlessness. It amounts to not, not really trusting God that he'll be there with us, that he'll give us the words to speak, that he has indeed filled us with his Holy Spirit. And he's told us that when you're brought before these people, you don't even have to prepare what you're going to say. I will give you the words. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that God will give us those very words to say? I was, in, I was encouraged as Brother Dale right before the service was telling me about an interaction that he had with somebody down his street where he got to talk about the Lord. Well, that's not going to happen if he doesn't walk across the street and have that conversation and risk having an awkward conversation and, and, and risk possibly upsetting somebody. Well, I can tell you one person he didn't upset, God. He didn't upset God. In fact, he was pleasing to God by doing that. That's a wonderful example for all of us. And I'm sure that you have a story like that just as well. You might have been nervous about sharing Jesus with somebody, but instead you said, you know what, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. Lord, just give me the words to say. And it turns out that the person may or may not have received Christ, but you know one thing, you obeyed the Lord. Friends, we're not responsible for the result. We are responsible to obey. That's what we're responsible for. If people reject, guess what? People rejected the word preached from the Apostle Paul. People rejected the word preached from Jesus himself. Even after he was raised up from the dead, they're going to reject us too. But there will be people who will hear the voice of God. Jesus says, my sheep know me. They hear my voice. We're just called to go out and find them. That's what we're called to do, just to be obedient. Faithlessness will lead you to fear man rather than trust God. That's what Isaac did. Isaac was more fearful of the Philistines than he was fearful of God. He's more fearful of the Philistines than he was willing to trust God. When God just said in the previous verses, I will bless you. I will be there with you. You just go and you sojourn. Path number two, that faithlessness will lead you down. Faithlessness will lead you to scheme rather than trust God. Not only to fear man, but faithlessness will lead you to scheme rather than trust God. Well, I know what God said to me, but what God said to me is something that I don't really trust. And so I'm just going to kind of scheme my way around this. I'm, I'm going to find a different path to the solution. So God tells me, don't worry about money. That's what he says in the book of Hebrews. He says, don't worry about money, for he has said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. You know, that, that verse is about dependence on money. And, and the writer of Hebrews says, don't worry about money. Don't worry about depending on that because God said, I'll never leave you nor will I forsake you. So because we don't have to be dependent on money, because we're dependent on God, we are free to bless people with the things that God has given us. Even if we don't have a lot of it or even if we did have a lot of it, we are free to bless people because money is not our God. Money is not our friend. Money is not faithful to us. God is. And so we're free to love other people. We're free to obey God by being faithful with that money because we trust that God will take care of us. We don't have to scheme. 
We don't have to scheme and plan about how we can hold on to as much money as possible and be greedy and build barns for ourselves and say, soul, you have much stored up for yourself. Eat, drink, and be merry. What did the Lord say about that kind of person in the parable? He said, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you, and the things that you have amassed, whose will they be? Instead, what should we do? We should store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We don't have to scheme. We, we, we don't have to try to manipulate situations. If God wants to open a door, He'll do it. If God wants to close a door, He'll do it. But we don't have to get a pry bar out and try to open the door for ourselves. We don't have to scheme because we can trust God. But faithlessness will lead you down a path of scheming rather than trusting God. That's the path that Isaac has gone down. He's fearing man and he is scheming when he didn't have to do either. Really, all he had to do was just trust what God had said very clearly in his word. Isaac didn't have to be a seminary student in order to exegete that. He knew exactly what God had said. He just didn't trust what he said. So he says, she's my sister. He feared to say, she is my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. Now, look at what it says down in verse 8 through 11, because this, this passage seemingly sandwiches that little interaction, that, that little faithless episode. Verse 1 through 5 is God declaring, I will be faithful to my covenant. And then verse 6 through 7, there's Isaac not trusting God to be faithful. In verse 8 through 11, you see God's gracious act of faithfulness. And you see it lived out through an unlikely character. You see God sovereignly using a foreign man, a, 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 an unbelieving man, in order to accomplish his will, in order to protect Isaac from his own sin. Look at verse 8 through 11, the demonstration of God's gracious faithfulness. It says, when he had been there a long time, so he lived in this lie for quite a while. When he had been there a long time, don't you think that must have bothered him? I, I think about that and I think, how, how could Isaac sleep at night? Every night going to sleep, laying next to a woman that he's telling everybody, she's my sister. It's got to bother his conscience at some point. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of, window, out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebecca, his wife. That is an interesting phrase. He saw Isaac laughing with his wife. We don't talk like that. I, I, I think, that, I think that, that Moses, as he records this, he's being modest about it. You say, well, Isaac was laughing. They're telling a joke. Well, that's not what that Hebrew word means. That Hebrew word does not mean that. Some translators actually say that it means caressing. Some of them are a little less couth, and they say that that word actually means fondling. He was playing around with his wife. Whatever that word means exactly, let's just say it left no doubt in Abimelech's mind right when he saw it. Those are not the things that brothers and sisters do. Those are things reserved only for a husband and a wife. Literally, the Hebrew sounds like it says this, and Abimelech saw Isaac Isaacing with Rebekah. It's a play on his name, a play on his, the word for his name, which means laughter. It says he looked out of the window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. That's actually the same word that Potiphar's wife in Genesis 39, verse 14 and 17, she says it two times when she rehearses the, the, the story to the servants and then also to her husband. She said, you brought this Hebrew slave into our home and he laughed at me. She was accusing Joseph of raping her. 
So it says, he saw her, him laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, she is your wife. There's no doubt about this. She is your wife. How then could you say, she is my sister? What does that sound like? That doesn't sound like an inquisition. That doesn't sound like he is just asking a question. That is a rhetorical question. That is a rebuke. How could you then say, she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I thought, lest I die because of her. What would any right standing man actually say at that point? Shouldn't you be willing to die for your wife? Isn't that a given? Shouldn't you be willing to lay down your life for her purity? Not Isaac at this point. He said, I thought, lest I die because of her. Verse 10, Abimelech said, what is this that you have done to us? Again, this is not a rehearsal of previous events. In Genesis 12, when Abraham hands his wife Sarai over to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Pharaoh rebukes Abraham. In Genesis 20, when he hands Sarah over to Abimelech, Abimelech rebukes Abraham. You remember Pharaoh, Pharaoh actually had them under armed guard and had them escorted all the way out of Egypt. Abimelech had to kind of bow the knee before Abraham because God told him, I'm going to kill you and all your family if you don't. So now King Abimelech rebukes the son just as well. Notice this. I found this quite striking and convicting. You would like to think that Isaac, he's received the covenant promises. That's reaffirmed, verse 1 through 5. Abraham, Genesis 22, such a faithful man, right? He obeys the Lord to the point of sacrificing, the willingness to sacrifice his only son. Abraham's a man of faith. And when you read Genesis 22, you seemingly forget about Genesis 12 and Genesis 20 where he hands his wife over because Abraham has now learned the lessons of faith, hasn't he? He's learned the lessons of faith. He has reached a point of, of spiritual maturity in his walk with the Lord and his dependence on the faithfulness of the Lord. But when Isaac comes onto the scene, what do you see? You would like to think that Isaac would, would imitate his father's faith. But the first thing you see Isaac do is imitate his father's fault not his faith. When I started thinking about that, I tell you what, I was very convicted. I was very convicted because I, I would like to think that I, I could hope that when my children look at me, they see a man of faith. But you know what they also see? They see a man with fault. They see a man with failures. And I would like to think that my kids would imitate all, the, all of the more spiritual parts of me as they age. But I, I'm fearful, I'm fearful that but for the grace of God, my kids are going to imitate my faults too. My, my kids are going to imitate the, the, the less sanctified parts about me. I pray that God overcomes that. I pray that God... God keeps my children from that. I, I see some of our more seasoned members looking at me and kind of just shaking their head like, yep. That's seemingly how it works. That our, our, kids, our kids will probably more than likely imitate our faults before they ever imitate our faith. So we need to make sure that we are quick to identify our faults, quick to repent of our faults. And very quick to reaffirm in our children's eyes and their ears and their presence that faith is the way that we follow the Lord. We apologize and we repent and confess our faults. And that's not the way that we should act. That's not the way we should live. And that's not the way that they should live either. We're still growing in grace, son. We're still, we're still growing in our faith. Imitate my faith. What does Paul say to the churches in the New Testament? He says, imitate me 
as I imitate Christ. No doubt Paul was not a perfect man. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. Sure, he's not going to tell the churches of the New Testament, imitate all the poor parts about me. Imitate the unsanctified parts about me. But friends, we like to think our faith is on full display, but most of the time our faults are taking center stage. So we need to be humble. Again, I'm, I'm not just saying this to you, I'm saying this to myself. Because I know my children watch me. I know they listen to me. And I know that, but for the grace of God... They'll imitate my faults before they imitate my faith. Now Abimelech is rebuking Isaac, a grown man, for the exact same sin that his father had committed. How then could you say she is my sister? Verse 9, Isaac said to him, because I thought lest I die because of her. You would think that the son would learn to cherish his wife. Instead, he treated his wife just the way his father did. Abimelech, verse 10, said, What is this that you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Abimelech, Abimelech announces to Isaac what Isaac was blinded by his faithlessness to see. Isaac, because of his faithlessness, was filled with cowardice, and he had no inclination. He didn't understand what was going on right in front of him, that his actions put his wife in grave danger and put the Philistines in grave danger. His sin was not privatized. His sin was open for everybody. His sin was going to bring mass casualties. I hope we understand that at this point, that sin is not like sniper fire. Sin is like shrapnel. Sin is like a bomb going off. It affects far more people than we ever intended. We would like to think that sin's consequences are localized to us, but they're not. They extend far more than we would think. And Isaac can't see this. He's blinded by his faithlessness, blinded by his fear and his cowardice. But Abimelech, an unregenerate heathen, a pagan, he sees it. It's very clear. But Isaac has abandoned reason for convenience. He's abandoned wisdom for security, so he thinks. And yet he's put everyone in jeopardy. He says, you would have, you would have brought guilt upon us. Get this, verse 11. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Whoever lays a finger on this man. Isaac, because of his fear, wrongly impugned the character of the Philistines. And now the man, this is ironic, isn't it? The very man that Isaac thought he had to fear is the one who issues a regal decree to protect him. Why? The Bible says that the heart of a king is like a stream in the hands of the Lord. That's why. Because Abimelech is a heathen man. He doesn't know Yahweh. But the heart of a king is like a stream in the hands of the Lord. And he turns it as he wills, wherever he wants it to go. And so now God has used, just like he will use Pharaoh to display the glory of his grace, now God is using Abimelech to display the gloriousness of his gracious covenant with Abraham and Isaac. You might ask yourself, why has Isaac been protected here? Why doesn't Isaac get his comeuppance? Why doesn't he get what's coming to him? Why does he get protected? Isaac deserves to be harmed. You know why he doesn't get harmed here? Why his wife doesn't get harmed here? One word. We've said this word before here. One word, grace. One word, grace. 
It was the graciousness of God's covenant promises, not to a man who deserved it, otherwise it wouldn't be grace. It was a covenant promise made to a man who didn't deserve it. Abraham learned how to live the life of faith. He didn't always walk in faith. Sometimes he walked by sight. In fact, he did the same thing his son would eventually do. Isaac is not walking by faith here, but Isaac will learn the lessons of faith. Why is God faithful to us? It is not because of our strength. It's not because of our wisdom. It's not because of our worthiness. It is because of his graciousness. That's why God is kind to us. That's why God is faithful to us. You know, God's grace is never, God's grace is never poured out on worthy individuals. In fact, God's grace is only poured out on unworthy. In fact, the more unworthy, the greater the demonstration of grace. I want you to listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. The apostle says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Isn't that interesting? We have this treasure in jars of clay. In other words, there's nothing special about us. In fact, there's a lot more worthy vessels out there. There's vessels of gold and silver. But we have this treasure, this Christ treasure in us, jars of clay. You think about a vessel holding what's inside of it from the outside. It holds it together from the outside. But that's not the way Paul describes being a Christian. He says we have this treasure in jars of clay. The treasure we have, we are not holding together. The treasure we have holds us together from the inside. We have this treasure in jars of clay. It's not our worthiness that God is after. It's the demonstration of his grace that he is seeking. So God seeks out people who are not just unworthy, but people who are very unworthy. Lest we ever think we have reason to boast. Listen to what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. This is stunning. He says, for consider your calling, brothers. Who is he writing to? He is writing to the church, to born-again believers in Corinth. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Can you imagine preaching that to your people? Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of the Lord. And because of him, notice that, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us with the wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let, him, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. And because of him, because of Jesus, you are in Christ Jesus. It's because of his grace. We have a treasure in jars of clay, unworthy vessels. What is Isaac? Isaac inherited a promise he was not worthy of. Abraham received a covenant promise that he was undeserving of. But God remained faithful to that covenant promise. Why? Because God's the one that made the promise. Because God was displaying the glory of his grace. When we are faithless, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. He says, the saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, 
if we're in relationship with him, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faith, faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Isn't that the wonderful truth of the gospel? That I'm not called on to be perfect in order to receive the gift of the gospel. What does he say that I have to do to receive forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, and the eternal covenantal faithfulness of God? What is it that I have to do? What does he say in 2 Timothy? He says, if we have died, that's it. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. God doesn't call on me to be perfect in order to receive what's due God calls me to recognize I'm not perfect and to die to that person and then be raised up with Jesus and by the power of the Spirit now walk in newness of life. Now, Paul says, walk worthy of the gospel to which you were called. I'm thankful that when I'm faithless, that God remains faithful. I'm thankful that God cannot deny himself because if God could go back on his word when I've acted faithless, God would have left me a long time ago. God's been faithful. God's been gracious. And by his kind providence, he has kept us. He has maintained us. Why? So that no one may boast in themselves. Friends, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Would you pray with me?